Hey, Prime members, you can binge all 10 episodes of Cold ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. This season of the Cold podcast includes descriptions of rape, sexual assault, murder, and domestic violence. Please take care in listening. A human skull rolled down a brushy hill between a suburban neighborhood and a busy Utah highway. The cranium came to rest in a litter of decaying leaves at the base of a barren scrub oak tree. It sat there for some time, hours, days, months, before a man walking his dog caught a glimpse of it. What you got there? The man who initially found it uh, walks along this frontage road every day and notice something in the bushes. He wasn't sure what it was at first, just that it appeared round and off-white, out of place amid the drab remains of last autumn's long-fallen foliage. But it had captured his curiosity, so he went in for a closer look. Only then could he see the unmistakable shape of the hollow eye sockets, the six teeth still stubbornly lodged into the maxilla. This was once the head of a living human being. But judging by the brittle appearance of the bone, this person had been dead for quite some time. The man, recognizing the skull as the partial remains of a person, recoiled, then pulled out his phone and called 911. Davis County Sheriff's deputies rushed to the site. They put up crime scene tape as the frigid dark of the February night descended. A sergeant fielded questions from curious reporters, her face lit by the hard lights of the TV cameras, her breath turning to fog in the chill. You don't know if an animal could have brought it from a different location. There's so many factors that we're going to try to piece together and find the origin of this skull. In other words, they didn't know much. In the days that followed, crime scene technicians scoured the hill for more bones. They uncovered a shallow grave at the top of that hill, just a few feet behind the backyards of several homes. The grave contained the skeletal remains of a young woman. It was a little disturbing to, to realize that there's a parts of a remnants of a body there. This discovery of a clandestine gravesite in early 2015 along U.S. Highway 89 between Salt Lake City and Ogden resulted in police agencies all across Utah questioning if the bones belonged to one of their missing people. Police in the city of Roy hoped the skull might belong to Cherie Warren. The grave sat midway between where Cherie had lived and where she had disappeared. Jack Bell, the original investigator on the Cherie Warren case, had retired six years earlier, in 2009, as assistant chief for the Roy City Police Department. He had never stopped wondering what had happened to Cherie. The last time I talked to anybody out here about that case, they had a pretty good sized cardboard box full of stuff. That stuff included Jack's handwritten notes. Jack told me he'd at one time tried to type those chicken scratches into a computer. Because I wasn't very proud of the work and I know my handwriting's terrible, but uh, I didn't get very far, so. So the notes had gone back into the box and the box had gone onto a shelf all but forgotten. It had collected dust until that skull rolled down a hill next to a busy highway between Salt Lake and Ogden. I was just in my office one day and my supervisor comes in with a box, one of those cardboard boxes and said, hey, they found uh, remains in Davis County, so we're reopening this cold case. It was Cherie Warren, and I didn't, I honestly didn't know much about the Cherie Warren case at all. That's the voice of Detective John Frawley. He had started with the Roy City Police Department in 2008, meaning his and Jack Bell's paths crossed only briefly. John had only been a cop about six years when he ended up with Jack Bell's old box of Cherie Warren case files. He was still relatively new to investigations, but had a sharp, analytical mind. The box contained Jack Bell's notes, a copy of the statement Carrie Hartman had given to his private investigator, reports from Las Vegas police about the discovery of Cherie's car, and a few other tidbits. 
John told me he had seen Cherie's face hundreds of times without ever realizing it. Cherie Warren's picture was actually in a display case in our lobby, and uh, I never made the connection. John had never stopped to study that old missing persons flyer. It looked a lot like the one Carrie Hartman had carried into Jack Bell's office almost 30 years earlier. The box also contained one of those old flyers Carrie Hartman had printed. John looked at it, seeing again the photocopied picture of a smiling Cherie Warren. He picked through the rest of the cardboard box, pulling out Jack's notes, struggling to decipher the former detective's handwriting. John read the original missing persons report. It described how Mary Sorensen had called police the day after Cherie failed to return home from work one October evening. Mary really kept her finger on the pulse of the case, you know, and was involved. John decided Roy police needed to reconnect with Cherie's relatives. I met with some of Cherie Warren's family members and just to collect some DNA so we had something to compare to. In the process, he learned Cherie's mom Mary had died about two years earlier. Um, I, was, I was never able to meet her and talk with her. But he did meet Cherie's dad, Ed Sorensen, as well as her son. In talking with, with her son, he, he asked about that. He said, you know, is her picture still out in the lobby? And I, I said, yes, and it's, you know, it's important to them. These interactions drove home to John just how frustrating the years with no answers must have been to the people who cared most about Cherie. So John went back to that banker's box of old case notes and reports. Yeah, literally taken off the shelf, I, yeah. The box didn't have everything, only a fragment of the Cherie Warren case covering the first year and a half of the investigation. That's because, as I've mentioned before, the case had been split between investigators from Roy, Ogden, and Salt Lake City. So John didn't yet have a full picture of the case, but he found himself fascinated by what he had seen. I was taking it home and reading it, you know, it was just, I was hooked on it. Yeah, I know the feeling, John. Meanwhile, the office of the Utah State Medical Examiner was trying to identify the bones found on that hillside. John sent the medical examiner one of the items he had found in the box, Cherie's dental records, for the sake of comparison. Everything sort of fit, meaning the time frame, it was a female, it was a same stature that Cherie Warren was. Cherie's case had been dormant nearly a decade when the discovery of these skeletal remains infused Detective John Frawley with a desire to find answers for Cherie's family. And I felt like, I felt like there was more that I could do on it. As, as an investigator, that's what you're driven to do, you know, dig in. This is Cold, Season 3, Episode 9, A Picture in the Lobby. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Dave Cauley. Roy Police Detective John Frawley had picked up the Cherie Warren cold case in February of 2015, after the discovery of unidentified skeletal remains in a clandestine grave. I started reading through this information in this box, and that's how the cold case started. John couldn't get Cherie's case out of his head. He had done some preliminary research and reestablished contact with Cherie's family, but he wanted to do more, so he had gone to talk to his boss. Carl Marino, C-A-R-L, and Marino, M-E-R-I-N-O. Carl Marino served as chief of police for Roy City from March of 2015 to May of 2021. We're going to spend a little time diving into Carl's background now to help you better understand his philosophy on cold cases. It's important because it shows why he was willing to greenlight John Frawley's continued work on the Cherie Warren case. And he had bumped up against one of the two suspects Carrie Hartman several times over the years. It's been really interesting to think how that case and my career have interacted. So let's look at Carl Marino's history with the Cherie Warren case. Carl started as a cop in 1983 when he took an unpaid volunteer position as a reserve officer with the Ogden Police Department. He signed on to the Reserve Corps right after Ogden Police Brass kicked Carrie Hartman out of it. Carl told me he had known Carrie back then, from his day job. 
he would come in where I worked as an industrial supply sales rep, and, and so I knew him from there. We had talked a little bit, but not much. He was a really outgoing guy, uh, came across always as very confident. You got the feeling that he thought he was better than everybody else, and kind of that feeling of he had a scam going on everybody. You know how somebody's always getting over. That was kind of the way he came across. It wasn't until a few years into Carl's time as an Ogden Reserve officer that he came to see Carrie Hartman in a different light. I was at work the one day and I got called by our coordinator who coordinated with the reserves. And he said, I need you to come to the police station and bring your gun. And that usually means you've done something wrong and you know they're taking your gun away and you know gonna not let you volunteer anymore and i thought i can't think of anything i could have done that would have done that so i went home and got it and took it to ogden police department and he said your gun was issued to carry hartman when he was a reserve with ogden and he has intimated that he used a gun with several of his rapes and we're thinking that it was probably this gun so we're taking it back to use as evidence in case we we can actually prove something with that. He only knew from reading the newspaper Carrie had also been dating Cherie Warren when she had disappeared. You know, it's easy to imagine that something happened between the two of them that got out of hand. Two years later, Carl took a full-time, paid position as a police officer. August of 89, uh, I got hired with Roy PD. By that point, the Cherie Warren case was already four years old and well on its way to going cold. Five more years went by before, in 1994, Carl switched departments. He became a detective for Salt Lake City. I was assigned to homicide, and while I was assigned there, we started to, to work cold cases. Carl had arrived in Salt Lake right at the end of that department's search for a suspected serial killer, a search that had soaked up a lot of money and manpower without much to show for it. Nothing was getting solved. As we've already seen in past episodes. I was assigned to look into some of those cases from the mid-80s, and that's the same time that Sheree Warren went missing from Salt Lake. Carl saw how jurisdictional politics had made Sheree's case a hot potato from the start. The last place she was known that people knew where she was was Salt Lake, so the case should have been handled out of Salt Lake. Uh, but they said, no, it's, she's a Roy citizen, and so we're not going to work it. Roy Police Detective Jack Bell had worked Cherie's case for a few years before handing it off to the Ogden Police Department, where it promptly went cold. Ogden Detective Shane Miner had picked Cherie's case up again in 1998, honing in on Carrie Hartman as his lead suspect. And so they thought that there was a connection there since he was, you know, a convicted rapist as well. But Shane's investigation had itself stalled in 2006, leaving Cherie's case cold once again. All the information Shane had gathered up to that point remained with him. His report didn't find its way into the hands of Salt Lake detectives like Carl Marino. Shane told me he had taken part in a few cold case conferences over the years, he had presented the Cherie Warren case, hoping to drum up some help. You put a bunch of guys together, a bunch of cops especially, and everybody's going to have great ideas. But then there's the follow through of, OK, who's going to do what and make sure this gets done. It had felt like doing a group project in school. A lot of people had great ideas, but no one seemed interested in doing the actual work. Years passed. Carl Marino was approaching retirement from his job in Salt Lake City when one day, he saw a yellow crime scene tape out of the corner of his eye while driving home from work. The body on the east side of the of 89. The spot where the dog walker had found that skull. I was still in Salt Lake when they found her. Carl followed the news of the discovery, wondering if the bones might belong to Cherie Warren. Deputies aren't saying who they have questioned in this current case, and they're not disclosing the cause of death at this time. Dental records allowed the medical examiner to identify the skeletal remains as those of a missing woman who had disappeared during the 1980s. But the medical examiner told Detective John Frawley the bones did not belong to Cherie Warren. The remains were later identified as uh, Teresa Greaves. She was 23 years old when she disappeared back in 1983, and right now deputies here in Davis County are investigating this as a homicide case. 
If this sounds familiar, it's probably because the discovery of Teresa Greaves' remains also came up in Cold Season 2. We don't have time to repeat Teresa's story here, but I will note her case still remains unsolved. Greaves had left her home in Woods Cross and told a roommate that she was taking a bus into Salt Lake City for a job interview. Salt Lake detectives had at the time declined to work Teresa's case, leaving it to investigators in the much smaller suburb of Woods Cross where Teresa had lived. Why did the Salt Lake detectives turn their back on Teresa in the 1980s? Perhaps a mixture of big city copy elitism and a desire to keep their crime stats down. The majority of missing persons cases resolve quickly, with the missing returning home. But those that don't, like Teresa Greaves' case, can linger for decades. Carl Marino told me Salt Lake detectives did the same thing two years later with Cherie Warren's case. They pushed that investigation off onto the Roy Police Department. But Roy did not at the time have the resources to conduct a robust investigation 40 miles away. I wonder if they spent the time in Salt Lake to gather all the evidence down here that they could have. Carl had started out in Roy, then gone to work in Salt Lake City, so he had seen both sides of the coin over the course of his career. But that career had taken an interesting turn in March of 2015, just weeks after the discovery of those skeletal remains on a hillside next to the highway. Carl Marino returned to the Roy City Police Department. They had an opening for chief of police, and I applied, and uh, they selected me. And so that's how Carl became Detective John Frawley's boss, just weeks after Frawley had reopened the Cherie Warren cold case. I did have one supervisor say, you know, after the remains were identified, well, okay, well, we're, we're, we're done, you know, we can kind of just move on. But there was a separate supervisor who said, you know, you don't have to put that back on the shelf. You can still work it. And that's what I wanted to do. I, I just felt like there was more to do on it. Carl told me he believes cold cases matter. And as chief, he vowed to put money and manpower behind that belief. Detective Frawley came to me and said, are you okay if I work this, Chief? I said, yeah, you know, let's get going. Detective John Frawley had both a personal desire and a mandate from his new boss to dig into the Cherie Warren case. He started by examining the facts. What did he know for sure about Cherie's final day? What did she plan on doing? She planned to meet Charles Warren at Wagstaff Toyota and give him a ride back to Ogden. John knew from reading Detective Jack Bell's notes, Chuck Warren had talked to Jack a couple of times. He told Detective Bell he never made it to Wagstaff's. He became ill. He went for a jog. At the end of that jog, he was too tired to go home, and he called his previous wife, Alice, to come pick him up. Um, to me, that makes no sense at all. It seemed like a shaky alibi. In John's mind, Cherie's ex-husband also had motive. There's a divorce. They're in the process of a divorce. So there's a house, a pension, a child. All these things are involved. John could see a hypothetical scenario in which Chuck Warren killed Cherie in an act of domestic violence, seeking to put an end to their fight over alimony and child support. But did Chuck have opportunity? The last person to see Cherie Warren was a co-worker. His name was Richard Moss. We met Richard in episode two. He was the credit union manager Cherie had been training the day she disappeared. I never saw what car she got into or her own car or another car. Or <laughs> I never saw her again. John called Richard in June of 2015. And he wanted to know or refresh or see what I could remember. It marked Richard's third round of questioning over a span of nearly 30 years, first by Jack Bell, then by Shane Miner, and now by John Frawley. Three conversations over the telephone. Richard lived in Richfield, a rural community about 200 miles from Roy. He told me I was the first person in nearly 40 years to come interview him face to face about Cherie Warren. Interestingly enough, I did speak to Richard Moss. He never did see Cherie get in her car. Richard's story remained consistent from the start through his telephone conversation with Detective John Frawley and my eventual meeting with him in 2021. He was under the understanding that 
Cherie was going to leave work and pick up her ex-husband and give him a ride back home to Ogden. Chuck Warren had said he had called off that meeting, but that's not what Cherie had told Richard as they had parted ways that evening in the garage behind the credit union office. I need to get past this plan that she had to meet him. John came across a report in the box of Roy Police Records. It talked about a tip that had come in about four months after Cherie disappeared. A credit union employee had told police Chuck Warren had made a cash advance on his credit card in person in Salt Lake City on the day of Cherie's disappearance. If that was true, it would mean Chuck had lied about where he was that day. Charles Warren was asked by Detective Bell if he would submit to a polygraph regarding his alibi. And as we know, Chuck Warren had refused that lie detector test. The tipster had told police she'd also heard Chuck had made credit card transactions in Nevada days before Cherie's car surfaced in Las Vegas. I mentioned this tip in passing way back in episode two, but here in 2015, Detective John Frawley couldn't find any indication his predecessor, Jack Bell, had ever verified it. So um, that needs to be looked into. John wrote a search warrant targeting Chuck Warren's financial records. He wanted account statements, copies of checks, or any details of transactions posted to Chuck's account during September, October, or November of 1985. A judge signed off on the warrant, and John sent it to the credit union. And a lot of that information was gone because of the time frame. The credit union no longer had Chuck Warren's checks, but it did have his credit card statements. I haven't seen them, so I can't tell you everything they revealed. But I do know the statements showed Chuck had made a purchase in Elko, Nevada on November 4th, 1985, followed by another at the Circus Circus Hotel and Casino in Reno, Nevada on November 8th, 1985. That's a little over a month after Cherie disappeared, and a matter of days before staff at the Aladdin Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas found her car abandoned in their back lot. I felt that it was a significant development. Because John suspected Chuck might have made those transactions while riding the train back to Ogden after dumping Cherie's car in Las Vegas. But there were some problems with this idea. Las Vegas sits at the far southern tip of Nevada. Elko and Reno are in the north. They're both nearly as far from Las Vegas as Ogden, Utah is. And there are no railroads directly connecting Elko or Reno to Las Vegas. And consider the timing. John had read the Las Vegas police reports about the car's discovery. They say it looks like it's been there for some time, based on dirt, debris. Chuck's transactions occurred on November 4th and 8th. Cherie's car turned up on the 11th, so that's a week at most. Not long enough for the car to have gathered a thick coat of dust. So Chuck Warren's credit card transactions in Nevada probably didn't have anything to do with dumping Cherie's car in Las Vegas. But John still found them suspicious. So did I, frankly, when I first found out about them. I wondered if Chuck had gone on gambling jaunts just weeks after his wife disappeared. If so, I didn't expect to get a straight answer about it. In fact, I thought I'd never hear Chuck Warren's side of the story. But it turns out, I was wrong. Roy City Police Detective John Frawley drove into Ogden on June 23, 2015. He carried a small voice recorder in his pocket, and he started it rolling as he pulled up to the curb outside an orange brick house. John stepped out of his car and walked past the driveway, noticing an old Toyota Supra parked there. He headed to the front door. John had come alone to the house belonging to Chuck Warren, the same house Cherie Warren had herself called home for a few brief years back in the early 80s. But it was a different woman who greeted John at the door. Hi, how are you? The microphone on John's audio recorder sometimes rubbed against his clothing as he moved, making a lot of noise. So I'll just tell you, the woman who answered the door 
identified herself as Willow, Chuck Warren's wife. A cat slinked between Willow's legs as she told John Chuck was in the other room. He was just getting his shirt buttoned up. So. Awesome. Come on in, Chuck. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. What? No, you're not going outside. The house looked much the same as it had when Cherie had lived there more than 30 years earlier. Same carpet, same everything. Only now, Willow lived there as Chuck's wife instead of Cherie. Chuck had met Willow Hendricks at a restaurant in Ogden called The Stagecoach in the late 2000s. He was a regular customer. She was working there as a server. They had a significant age gap, 27 years, but they hit it off and began dating. Willow had soon moved in with Chuck. They were married in 2013 and soon after held a ceremony at an Elvis impersonator chapel, if you can call it that, in Las Vegas. So Chuck and Willow's wedding had come just a couple of years before Detective John Frawley showed up on their doorstep in 2015. Chuck stepped into the room after a moment to meet the detective. Is, is there somewhere we could talk for a couple of minutes? Maybe? Sure. This is the first time you're hearing Chuck Warren's actual voice in this podcast. None of his prior interactions with police in this case were recorded. I'm here to talk to you. I, just, I was assigned a case a few months ago, Cherie Warren. What had happened is uh, some remains were found in Davis County. I don't know if you saw that on the news or not. I didn't. Okay. And anytime something like that happens, a lot of old cases are kind of reopened and and so the case was assigned to me. I read through it and was wanting to know if I can just talk to you and help me answer some questions and clear some things up. I know that you, you talked to Detective Bell when I was about 30, not quite 30 years ago. But. John said, I know that you had talked to Detective Bell not quite 30 years ago. Chuck replied, damn near. Yeah. And I, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Charles. I... <laughs> His notes would probably be the best source. <laughs> Chuck said Detective Jack Bell's notes from 30 years earlier would be the best source for his story. Chuck said he had recently suffered a stroke. It had impacted his memory. Sometimes I can remember things, and, yeah. but what I said at that time, I, you know, he'd have it all down, I would think. Yeah. How good he wasn't taking his notes. I used to have a photographic memory. If I had a phone number, right? you know, right. I could uh, remember forever. Yeah. Or even numbers on cars. Well, I'm sorry to, sorry to hear that. Uh, um, but I was wondering if, you know, actually reading through that report, I, I have more questions, actually. I, and so that's why, I, you know, I was like, oh, I'll call Charles and yeah. you know, maybe talk to him. Well... Ask me and I'll see what I Yeah, mean. well, I'd like to, if we could, maybe just go back to stuff from the day that Cherie disappeared. They went through the child custody arrangement Chuck and Cherie had worked out during the summer of 1985, after they had separated. Chuck said he had worked graveyards at the railroad, and Cherie had worked days at the credit union. They would meet each morning to trade custody of their son. She would drop him off at Denny's. We'd have coffee together, and then she'd go to work. Okay. And then uh, the same in the afternoon. Chuck told John he'd worked midnight to 8, and he had gone to meet Cherie at the Denny's shortly after that. But Jack Bell's notes said something different. In his report, he says that you and Cherie met at the Denny's at 7 a.m., around Could 7 at 7. Couldn't have been 7? No. I, would, I'd be, I worked till 8. Okay. I wouldn't have left an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> there were other small inconsistencies between Jack's notes and what Chuck Warren told Detective John Frawley in this interview. Jack's notes described Chuck taking his and Cherie's son to breakfast before dropping the boy off with Chuck's parents for the day. But Chuck told John he didn't remember doing that. He thought he had given the boy to Alice, his first wife. Then it I it actually says that you and Alice go to lunch. Uh, that day? Yeah. Uh, I ain't talking about that. Okay. But could have, but I don't know. John asked what Chuck had planned to do later that day, on the afternoon of Cherie's disappearance. You had asked her to pick you up at Wagstaff Toyotas, 
or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you tell me more about that? Well, I don't. I never made it down there. Yeah. And I called and told her. Okay. Uh, you know, I was going to make it. Yeah. And, uh, but I just never made it down you, there. You never made it down there. Yeah. Can you tell me, Charles, how, what changed your plans? Why didn't you go to Wagstaff? Do you remember that? Uh, I was looking at cars, I think, and, uh, or something was wrong with my car. I can't remember. And, um, I can't remember, I don't know. Not a very satisfying answer. Chuck said he had called Cherie at the credit union sometime around 4, which was consistent with what he had told Detective Jack Bell back in 1985. Chuck told Detective John Frawley he couldn't remember what he had done after making the call to Cherie. John said, according to Jack Bell's notes, Chuck had gone for a jog. Chuck said that was right. He had jogged from his house into downtown Ogden, but the sun had gone down, so he had stopped. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say it. He always run in the dark. <laughs> uh, no, it seemed like he got dark, and that's when I went to Denny's. A different Denny's. Not the Denny's where he'd picked up his son from Cherie earlier that morning. Chuck said he'd ordered a cup of coffee and called his first wife, Alice, asking her to come pick him up. Oh, okay, that makes that makes sense. So you go for a jog, and then you're there at the Denny's having some coffee. And yeah, she yeah, picks you up. a lot of Denny's coffee. <laughs> Do you still yeah. drink it? Yeah. yeah. Chuck Warren's story left him with a roughly two-hour window on the afternoon of Cherie's disappearance for which he had no real alibi. He had told Jack Bell in 1985 he spent those two hours jogging. Just jogging. And you actually gave your whole jogging route to him. That route took Chuck four miles from his house into the heart of downtown Ogden, then another mile and a half back to that Denny's restaurant. Chuck hadn't provided any specific destination for his jog back in 1985, and he didn't volunteer one now either. Well, I appreciate you talking with me. Um, like I said, I this case, you know, it's open. It's an open case, but Reading through there, I, questions come up, you know, and, and I can't help you with them. Oh, you did actually. You helped me quite a bit. Detective John Frawley asked Chuck what he had done that night after his jog. Chuck said he had spent the evening at home with his first wife, Alice. I went to bed early. I went to bed early. But wait, didn't Chuck work graveyards? John asked about this inconsistency, and Chuck became confused. He said he couldn't remember whether he had gone to work that night or if he had stayed home with Alice. That I can't tell you. A long time ago. But Chuck remembered wondering where Cherie was, why she hadn't come to pick up her son. He said he had called Cherie's mom, Mary Sorensen. It was before 10 o'clock and after 9.30, that's all. Okay, between 9.30 and 10 p.m. You're Somewhere in there. You called Mary and said, yeah. hey, where is she at? Yeah. Okay. This was different from what Chuck had told Detective Shane Miner in 1999. Back then, Chuck said Mary had called him looking for Cherie, not the other way around. And there's no record in the case files Mary ever mentioned talking to Chuck on the phone that night. John moved on to the day after Cherie disappeared. He said according to Jack Bell's notes, Chuck had gone to work that day on the day shift. And you worked for the railroad. What, what did you do for the railroad? I was a clerk at that time. But this wasn't like you getting on a train and traveling no. around. This was you working in an office. Straight there. What do you have? Okay. Jack Bell had tried to call Chuck at the rail yard that day. Chuck hadn't been there. A co-worker had reportedly told Jack Chuck had come in that morning but left sick a bit before noon. Detective John Frawley asked Chuck if he had, in fact, left work sick that day. The only time I took off work is uh, when I was going partying. If I was sick, I went to work. You know? <laughs> yeah. So I uh, used my sick leave to go partying. Okay. Chuck didn't explain what he meant by partying. John pressed. Why hadn't Chuck gone to police detective Jack Bell about his missing wife? I guess he had been trying to call you. Did he, did he leave messages for you to call him? I wouldn't have left work in the middle of the shift. 
Okay. But according to Jack's notes, Chuck had described leaving work and going into downtown Ogden the day after Cherie disappeared, to more or less the same place he had gone while out jogging the afternoon prior. That seems a bit strange to me. I know from talking to police who worked Ogden in the 80s, the area where Chuck said he had jogged to the evening of Cherie's disappearance, then returned to the following day, happened to be a hot spot for prostitution. I bring that up because while researching Chuck Warren, I learned Salt Lake Police cited him for sexual solicitation in April of 1993. That's a fancy way of saying he got a ticket after being caught in a prostitution bust. The court record doesn't provide much detail, beyond saying Chuck pleaded guilty and paid a $200 fine. All in all, pretty petty crime. But embarrassing, the kind of thing a guy might want to keep hidden from a nosy detective. Now think back to that tip I mentioned several minutes ago. A credit union worker had told police she had heard Chuck took a cash advance on the day Cherie disappeared. Why would Chuck have needed cash? This all leads me to wonder if Chuck might have met someone while out for that jog. Detective John Frawley needed to pin down as much of Chuck's timeline as possible, but Chuck said he couldn't remember anything specific about that day after Cherie disappeared. His wife, Willow, interrupted to ask if any of his old co-workers might remember. It's one of the railroaders that worked with you at that time that would remember when... They're all dead, dead honey. <laughs> no one could say for sure where Chuck Warren was or what he had done the day after his wife disappeared. Do you keep any uh, time call records from that time? Do you have any records like that? No. <laughs> uh, I know. Was, she said you kept everything, so... Just, no, no, just I, I, I have lots of checkbooks. <laughs> I wasn't in the room, but I can just imagine Detective John Frawley's face when Chuck Warren's wife, Willow, said she had Chuck's old checkbooks. Those were just the kinds of records John wanted. How far back do your checkbooks go in the closet? Uh, I don't know. I think this is the 80s. <laughs> the time period, honey. Checkbooks weren't all Chuck had in his closet. He said he still had his very first cell phone. The very first one, and you still have it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he keeps everything. I saved all of them except the, the ones that got stolen. He keeps everything, Willow said. But Chuck couldn't remember if he'd had that cell phone in 1985. I don't know, you had a lot of the first ones that came out, so you might have, but yeah. I don't know. What, so you did have a cell phone a long time ago? I, I did a long time ago, but I don't know where I had it at that time. John didn't let this go. Did you have a cell phone in 85? I don't know for sure. Possibly. I don't know, I can't remember what year I actually got it. It would have been one of the first ones coming out. I mean, yeah. I mean, I remember those day rings. The Motorola Dynatac was the first commercially available cell phone. Today, most people just know it as the brick. It hit the market in 1983, two years before Cherie disappeared. Chuck said he had for sure had a cell phone in 88, but he wasn't sure about 85. John Frawley wondered what evidence a digital forensics lab might be able to scrape from a device that primitive if Chuck Warren had owned one when Cherie disappeared. I can tell you from my work on the Susan Powell case in Cold Season 1, cell phone forensics are a critical tool in many modern investigations. But cell phones of the 1980s are dinosaurs compared to the smartphones of today. The Motorola Dynatac didn't have a camera, GPS, or SIM card, let alone apps or a web browser. Still, you never know what you might find unless you look. Is it the one I still have down the hall? Might be, yeah. John didn't tell Chuck he had already obtained his old bank statements with a search warrant, but he tipped his hand just a bit to ask about something specific. You had a financial transaction in Elko, Nevada, in the, in the beginning of, of November. Financial transaction in Elko. Elko, Nevada, yeah. Chuck said he had started commuting between Ogden and Roseville, California, just outside of Sacramento, at some point after Cherie disappeared. He had driven I-80 across Nevada every two weeks. Elko sat on that interstate. Whatever that was in Elko, I probably would have stopped there for gas. That was the halfway point, you know? I, if you looked 
every two weeks you'd probably see a receipt there. But he couldn't say for sure. When I heard you worked for the railroad, I thought you were like actually traveling from state to state on the railroad, but that's not what you did. Okay. This seemed to further discredit the theory Chuck might have used his railroad access to hitch an untraceable ride home from Las Vegas after dumping Cherie's car there. But Chuck hadn't managed to allay many of Detective John Frawley's other suspicions, and he certainly hadn't cleared himself as a suspect. To the contrary, his actions on the day of Cherie's disappearance and the day after remained questionable. Hey, Charles, is it okay if I come out and talk to you or call you again if I have any questions? Is that all right? I I do appreciate your time and talking with me. Chuck apologized for his faulty memory and again said he believed Jack Bell's notes were the best source for his story. John tossed another question at Chuck, almost as an aside. How do you know Kerry Hartman? I don't. Oh, okay. I've never seen him before. (laughs) Okay. Chuck said Detective Jack Bell had dropped by to talk to him once, after Carrie's arrest in the rape case. Jack had reportedly told Chuck how Carrie had come in a week or so after Cherie disappeared. At that time, Carrie had described a co-worker of his having a psychic dream. He had a dream that she's up in the mountain? Yeah. Yeah, the big finder up there. You know, I, if he didn't put it in there, then... I, I don't think I dreamed that up. <laughs> I, I remember him telling me that, though. Because I remember that something about Carrie. Him or his buddy had a vision of something. Enough. Chuck was just regurgitating the same stories we've heard before. Carrie's co-worker had a dream about Cherie's death. An anonymous psychic sent KSL a letter about it. Only now, it had gone a few steps through the rumor mill and was being fed back into the investigation. This is how misinformation poisons investigations. Detective John Frawley wasn't going for it. It could be great information. It could be very interesting. But does it get us to our goal? John did not intend to entertain psychics and seances. We're going to stick to the evidence and what we can absolutely say we know and filter everything else out. Jack Bell, the original investigator on the Cherie Warren case, had tried to put the screws to his lead suspect, Chuck Warren, working the human angle. Shane Miner, the former Ogden cop who had taken up the Cherie Warren cold case in 1998, had focused on trying to find her remains on the mountain where the second suspect, Carrie Hartman, might have dumped her. John Frawley brought a new approach. He wanted to prove the case by the record, show who had motive, means, and opportunity. Really uh, dissect the involved parties' stories. And John suspected there was more to Chuck Warren's story than Chuck was willing to admit. Roy City Police Detective John Frawley had found several inconsistencies with Chuck Warren's story about the disappearance of his ex-wife, Cherie Warren. John wanted Chuck's old time cards to see if they might shed light on where Chuck was the day Cherie turned up missing. That was, that was difficult. The railroad Chuck had worked for, Southern Pacific, had merged with Union Pacific in the mid-90s. By 2015, the old railroad's daily employee records were long gone. There's things that that we couldn't get that were lost, like uh, persons of interest, their their time cards, you know, things like, you know, were they at work? Chuck's time cards might have revealed whether he had gone to work at all the morning after Cherie vanished. Without them, John could only wonder. You're really behind. If Chuck had gone to work on the day shift that morning, as he had originally told police in 1985, he would have started around 8 a.m. In a past episode, we did our math homework, the story problem about how much time it would have taken to get Cherie's car to Las Vegas on the night of her disappearance, then return home to Utah. Making it to Ogden by 8 a.m. would have been nearly impossible. But we can't say for sure if Chuck did or didn't go to work that day without his time card. 
Her car is found at the Aladdin Hotel and Casino on November 11th, and uh, it's processed by Las Vegas police. Processed means scouring the car for evidence. Today, forensic technicians would vacuum the car for hair or fibers, use chemical reagents to look for blood, check for fingerprints, or maybe even use a cadaver dog to sniff for a whiff of human decomposition. Collecting DNA evidence wasn't yet standard practice in 1985. The Las Vegas police records I've obtained only mention searching for fingerprints. There is a print on the window, and they collect that print. The Las Vegas police records say it appeared the print came from a woman, but they had never linked them to anyone specific. In fact, Detective Jack Bell had never seen those prints. Because like I said, my bosses didn't want me to go down there. Jack had tried to find a copy of Cherie's fingerprints to compare against way back then, but had come up empty. I got a lot of faith in Las Vegas' PD. It's baffling to me police didn't show more interest in Cherie's car at the time. There's paperwork in one of the reports of what they found. In an alternate universe, Jack would have written a search warrant for the car, then had a wrecker haul it back from Las Vegas. Cherie's car would have ended up in evidence, and crime scene technicians here would have torn it apart. Who knows what they might have found? Maybe they would have kept the car all these years, giving John Frawley an opportunity to examine it again today with better techniques and technology. Instead, the car just sat in a Las Vegas impound lot. Uh, and then the car is later given back to Charles Warren. Records show Chuck picked the car up on Christmas Eve of 1985. Six months later, he had traded it into a dealer. John wanted to know where Cherie's car had gone from there. He ran the car's VIN number and was able to follow it for a few years before losing the trail. We tried to track it down and it's long gone. Whatever secrets Cherie's car might have held, they're lost to us now. John talked to Chuck and Cherie's son, Adam, in October of 2015. Adam remembered his dad visiting casinos in Reno when he was a kid. Adam also specifically recalled going to Las Vegas one time with Chuck, when he was about seven years old. And he told me that the Aladdin Casino was a place that his father frequented. The trip Adam described would have happened in 1989, four years after Cherie disappeared. And Adam actually remembered his father taking him there on a vacation to the Aladdin. Why would Chuck Warren have taken his and Cherie's son to the Aladdin, of all places? So I found that significant. John kept thinking about those old checkbooks, squirreled away in Chuck Warren's closet. Decades of financial documents that might reveal where Chuck had gone and when in the fall of 1985. He again went to talk to his chief, Carl Marino. We found out that there were a lot of mistakes made early in the investigation. Carl told me in his experience, cops often resist sharing information with the public, victims, witnesses, and even with other officers. And there can be good reasons for that. Giving out too much info can tip off suspects or taint an investigation. It's a balancing act. You've got to know what you can release. But Carl told me, Police egos sometimes cause investigators to be overprotective. That can lead to turf battles that stymie investigations. When you're trying to solve crimes, it's not a competition, except between law enforcement and whoever committed the crime. Carl believed jurisdictional squabbles were part of what had gone wrong with the Cherie Warren case. There wasn't a big flashing neon sign that said murder with an arrow pointing to a body in Salt Lake, where Cherie had last been seen. So the Salt Lake City Police Department had declined to put much effort into what it viewed as a Roy City missing persons case. I think there should have been more pressure put on Salt Lake to, to help with it. I have no idea even what evidence might have been collected there. There are no witness statements in any of the Cherie Warren case files from employees at Wagstaff Toyota, where Cherie had planned to meet Chuck on the afternoon of her disappearance. Likewise with patrons of the bar where Carrie Hartman supposedly spent that evening. No one identified or questioned them. The dealership was in Salt Lake City, 
the bar was in Ogden. The Salt Lake and Ogden Police Departments could have helped the much smaller Roy Police Department by gathering those statements. There were opportunities for evidence gathering. But both Salt Lake and Ogden had at first wiped their hands of the Cherie Warren case. It wasn't their problem. Carl agreed with his detective, John Frawley. They needed to chase the evidence, and they now knew at least some of that potential evidence was sitting in Chuck Warren's closet. With his chief's blessing, John wrote up another search warrant. This time, he asked a judge for permission to go into Chuck's home, the same house Sharia had once lived in, and hunt for any financial records from 1985. John also wanted Chuck's old cell phones. Chuck's wife, Willow, had told John she and Chuck kept everything, including his old cell phones, amid all her clutter in the basement. I thought that's where we had the brick phones, too, but it's not. I know I've seen them, though. They're probably in your other closet. John served the warrant on December 14, 2015. He and others from the Roy City Police Department scoured Chuck's house, taking five checkbooks, a pile of floppy disks, bank statements, mortgage papers, and more. But they didn't find any old cell phones. Where those had gone, I can't say. I also don't know what Roy police learned from looking through all of Chuck's old financial papers. Chief Carl Marino told me that evidence has to remain private. You're right, you do have to keep certain things back. What I can tell you is the search warrant did not lead to an arrest. Nothing police found provided probable cause to book Chuck Warren into jail for his ex-wife's presumed murder. Detective John Frawley was learning just how crushing the Cherie Warren case could be. And then Detective Frawley got transferred to undercover narcotics. Frawley had had Cherie's case for about a year. He had done more than anyone else had in a decade. And he had only just started getting some momentum when he had had to turn away. Yeah, it is tough because your day-to-day caseload doesn't stop. John handed the box of Cherie Warren case files back to Chief Carl Marino. The box would get passed and it just kept getting overlooked. And so the case moved on to another detective, Ryan Reed. And he worked at some, but he was, you know, it was, again, he had all of his other duties. And so it didn't get worked a lot. The Cherie Warren case lapsed into inactivity once again. For Carl Marino, it felt like going back on a promise. It's not ideal, but for a smaller department, you can't task somebody with just working an old case like that. You just don't have the staffing to do that. Former Ogden City Detective Shane Miner had himself spent years driven to find answers about what had happened to Cherie Warren. He had picked up that torch in 1998, but his flame had sputtered in 2006 after a series of setbacks. Like I said, a lot of this stuff I did on this case was when I had time to work on it. And that time got more and more precious. Right. Shane had documented all his contacts, building a list of potential witnesses. He had kept notes, newspaper clippings, and all sorts of other records. And he had compiled a 30-plus page summary of the case, making it ready for any future investigator who might one day take over. That's who's going to pick up that case on the shelf and start looking into it because of the time that's involved and costs that could be involved. So, By the time the remains of Teresa Greaves emerged on a hillside in 2015, Shane was deep in preparation for a capital murder trial. There was a couple other cases I was involved with that was very demanding. One of them was the case we covered in Cold Season 2, the disappearance of Joyce Yost. At the start of 2015, Doug Lovell, the man who had killed Joyce, was asking a Weber County jury to take him off death row. Shane had spent months working with prosecutors, helping them prepare for Lovell's trial. The Joyce Yost case consumed Shane's time and attention, So he didn't take part in Roy City's renewed Cherie Warren investigation in 2015, though he was aware of it. They did pick it up and assign a detective to start doing some stuff on it. Doing some stuff like interviewing Chuck Warren. They were just kind of reiterating, redoing the same stuff that had been done. And getting nowhere. Then Roy Detective John Frawley moved into undercover narcotics. As I said, the investigation went dormant for two years. 
John returned from his undercover assignment with a renewed desire to close the Cherie Warren case. What our goal and what we're driven for is, is to get the family some answers, you know. So in February of 2018, he invited Shane Miner to come brief the Roy City Police Department about his work on the case. Yeah, I took it over to the admin. I'm like, you know, I'm done. And I felt uncomfortable about just looking for that one piece. John Frawley had operated under the assumption Chuck Warren was his prime suspect, and for good reason. That's the conclusion most people would draw by reading Jack Bell's old case notes. The notes do mention Carrie Hartman, first as a witness and then later as a serial rapist, but Jack's notes don't give the impression Carrie had any motive to murder Cherie. Shane Miner had learned a lot more about Carrie during his years working the case. Shane told John about Carrie's ties to the Ogden Police Department. He's a reserve police officer. You know, he, he understands police work more than your typical person. Shane told John about the two women who had lived above Carrie at the time of Cherie's disappearance, who had reported Cherie coming to their house one night in early October 1985. They heard her voice. They knew her voice. They saw her car outside. They knew her car. Shane told John about how Carrie had met up with his TV reporter friend Larry Lewis a few days later. They were actually riding three-wheelers up in the foothills. And Shane said just one day after that, the elk hunting guide Fred Johns had seen Carrie and another man on the mountain behind Kazi Reservoir. Fred Johns was positive that this was Carrie Hartman. He knew him. Shane told John he had confirmed Carrie knew his way around that mountain. It was private land, but he had a key from a friend. He had access to that area. The same general area where an anonymous caller had in 1987 told police he had stumbled across a body. Don't report no body that I found. He described this, this decomposing body uh, with a purse next to it. Human remains which had still not been found. Shane told John about how he had served a pair of search warrants at Carrie's apartment after Carrie became the key suspect in the Ogden City Rapist investigation. A gray leather suede jacket was found and placed into evidence at the Ogden Police Department. Shane told John how, years later, he had pulled that gray suede jacket out of evidence and showed it to Cherie's mom, Mary Sorensen. And Mary identified that jacket as to what she was wearing on October 2nd when she went to work. Or at least that's what Mary thought Cherie might have worn that day. There's some ambiguity on this point. And that jacket was located in Carrie Hartman's closet. John was coming to understand the potential significance of the gray jacket. If it's what Cherie left the house wearing on the morning of her disappearance, it couldn't have ended up in Carrie's possession unless Carrie and Cherie had met up at some point later that day. Shane Miner passed the baton of the Cherie Warren case over to John Frawley. That meant Roy police assumed custody of the gray suede jacket. I told John I wanted to see it for myself, hoping I might be able to match it up to an old family photograph of Cherie. I could only do that if I knew what it was I was looking for. It's September of 2022, and I'm in the basement of Roy City Police Headquarters. I follow an evidence technician named Chelsea Scott through a locked door into a small room. Ooh, it stinks of marijuana. Metal shelving lines the walls. Chelsea points to a box on the top of the shelf in the back of the room. It says Office Depot on the lid. This contains the jacket the jacket police seized from Carrie Hartman's apartment way back in 1987. Chelsea points to another, smaller box on the next shelf down. We have miscellaneous items here. We have fingerprints from her vehicle that's located in Las Vegas. And I can see a plastic case containing floppy disks off to the side, which I suspect came out of Chuck Warren's house. I can bring this up. Anything you want me to bring up, I'm happy to, and then you can get, like, different shots. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm carrying a still camera and I'm accompanied by a TV videographer. Chelsea carries the boxes out of the evidence room and sets them on a conference table. 
Detective John Frawley's there, and I invade his personal space while clipping a small microphone to his shirt collar. John, excuse my uh, no, go for familiarity it. here. Uh, yeah, no problem. John sits down in front of the Office Depot box, which is sealed by red plastic tape printed with the word evidence in black letters. John tears open the box, then pulls a brown paper bag out of it. I can see numbers written in red and black marker on the bag. I recognize them. They are the Ogden Police Department's case numbers for one of Carrie Hartman's rapes and the Cherie Warren homicide. The words coat and test fire bullets are written on the bag as well, along with a barcode label from the Utah State Crime Lab. John pulls another item from the box. So this was the hanger that the jacket was on. Then he opens the paper bag and removes the jacket. He sets it on the table, and I lean in for a closer look. That is not a men's jacket. No, it is not. My first impression, the jacket's smaller than I had expected. It has a crop body and pinches in a bit toward the waist. There's a tag on the inside that says eight. It's on the smaller side of medium. Yeah, this is not, in my opinion, not gonna fit even a medium build man, let alone a larger build man. The jacket has a stand-up collar and ruffles that run vertically over each shoulder. A decidedly feminine touch. There are five buttonholes down the lapel, but only four buttons on the opposite side. The button that should be second from the top is missing. The suede leather fabric is colored a medium gray. It's a neutral color that makes the jacket versatile. It would have coordinated well with a variety of outfits, but now it's crumpled, having spent decades wadded up in a bag. At some point, someone has used a sharpie to make markings on the inside of the jacket, toward the bottom of the front flap. John tells me he thinks it's from when Ogden police sent the jacket to the crime lab 22 years ago. And it was tested for any evidence of blood or hair or any sort of fibers that could be found. We heard about that in episode six. The crime lab hadn't found anything. Based on the technology of that time, that's correct. It didn't yield any results. But I also know John recently resubmitted the jacket for another round of testing. Yeah, I mean, it's 22 years, you know. He doesn't tell me what, if anything, was different this time around. I've now gone back and looked at every photo I have of Cherie. There aren't many, and the gray suede jacket's not in any of them, but it does fit her style. It strikes me as perfectly plausible Cherie Warren might have worn that jacket to work on the morning of October 2nd, 1985. But the whole hang-up is that Mary's the only one that can say... Again, Cherie's mom, Mary Sorensen, told police she thought it was the jacket her daughter left the house wearing on the day of her disappearance. If that's true, the jacket is evidence that potentially puts Cherie and Carrie Hartman together after Cherie was last seen. Mary Sorensen has since died. Police asked Cherie's dad, Ed, and sister, Marcy, about the jacket. Nobody can say whether she's wearing that or not. So the only person that could is now deceased. Maybe not the only person. There's one other who might know if Cherie was wearing it on that day. His name is Carrie Hartman. Detective John Frawley needed to pose this question to Carrie. But Carrie hadn't said a word to police about Cherie Warren since 2005. And Carrie had no incentive to talk to John Frawley now. John had found himself mired in the middle of the Cherie Warren mystery, like all of us are now. He had walked past Cherie's picture in the police department lobby hundreds of times without giving it a thought. That had changed once he had looked inside the box. It's not just a picture in the lobby. It makes it very real. Carrie Hartman had gone to prison at the end of 1987 on a sentence of 15 years to life. The prosecutor who had put him there had expected Carrie would only serve the minimum 15 years. But as we've heard this season, Carrie's own unwillingness to take responsibility for what he had done resulted in a much longer stay. How long have you done in prison? 32 years, sir. 
And how old are you? I'm 72. Yeah. You know, you've thrown away a big chunk of your life. Just, I mean, it's just, it, just, it is sad. This comes from a recording of Terry Hartman's hearing before the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole on October 29th, 2019. If I had to describe Carrie's first trip before the board in 1992, I would say, Carrie, Carrie, quite contrary. You heard it yourself back in episode six. Carrie Hartman didn't do it. There is no way on this earth. But 27 years and a few more rejections from the board had taught Carrie how to speak to those who held his freedom in their hands, like parole board member Bradley Rich. Why do you think you were in here as long as you have been? My choices. Carrie had learned to swap contrary for contrite. It was a blessing to come to prison, sir. Yeah. I deserved what I got. Bradley, the parole board member, asked Carrie what had been happening in his life prior to his arrest all those years ago. What had led him to break into women's homes, to threaten to kill their children, and to sexually assault them? I operated on thinking distortions. That, that were troublesome. Troublesome thinking distortions. How wonderfully vague. When I can't sort out these distorted thinking errors, which I have learned to do at this point, I've worked really hard throughout these many years to correct those distorted thinking errors. Mm -hmm. I met my needs in unhealthy ways. Like, he said, by impulse spending. Bradley said that answer didn't quite hit the mark. You had, to my way of thinking, a very peculiar and dangerous response to stress. I mean, others might go out and get drunk or revert to the use of drugs or, you know, binge spend or whatever it is, you know, uh, go through a gallon of ice cream. Uh, you chose to violently rape under stress. And, and, and so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make heads or tails of that. Those were, those were parts of my life that were surrounded by pornography in those days. Mm -hmm. I described that as my drug of choice. When I, when I felt lowly and had no self-esteem, when my life was falling apart, I turned to pornography and masturbation. That led to cruising for women and choosing women to make victims. Low self-esteem led to pornography which then led to rape. I wish to be defined as who I am now and not who I was. I'm a different man now than I was 40 years ago. Carrie had lived nearly half his life in custody. As much sympathy as I feel for your victims at the same time, you've made yourself a victim as well, and you've paid a heavy price for it. But had he paid in full? That was up to the parole board to decide. Bradley went over the latest memo from Carrie's sex offender therapist. It said if paroled, Carrie stood about a 1 in 10 chance of committing a new sex offense, a 3 in 10 chance of carrying out a violent crime, and a 5 in 10 chance of committing any crime. In other words, 50-50, Carrie would do something that might land him back in prison. And that makes you a, still kind of a, of, a, of a risk. But on the other hand, Carrie had obtained a new more favorable treatment memo just a few months earlier. He handed it over to Bradley. Treatment summary, Justin Clark, right there. Ah, sure enough. The updated report said Carrie now presented a below average risk to reoffend. The parole board had repeatedly teased Carrie with a promise of release, but to earn it, he'd had to admit to rape the board had cajoled him into taking part in a police interview about Shuri Warren. And the board demanded Carrie make several trips through sex offender therapy. Carrie had complied. And now, the board seemed mollified. You're going to get an opportunity to succeed or fail, my prediction, um, in the not-too-distant future. No more fake-outs. No more demands. The parole board had nothing left to ask of Carrie. Then uh, all we can do is, is, is wish you the best. You have done a big chunk of your life, 32 years in here, and uh, you're not a young man. Can you see where this is heading? 
I, I wish you well. And, and like I say, I'm, I'm with or without a further hearing, I think you're going to get an opportunity. And then we'll see if you've acquired the skills you need to stay out of trouble. Thank you so much. All right. Carrie Hartman left prison in March of 2020. His release escaped public notice due to the COVID-19 pandemic that was sweeping the globe. Carrie quietly headed back to Ogden, to the same community he had terrorized three decades before. On the season finale of Cold... Is he out? Yes. Oh, I didn't know he was out. Yeah, yeah. That honestly makes me a little nervous. Mm. Okay, well, and he lives in Ogden. Go knock. Hey, Carrie. If you have information about the disappearance of Cherie Warren, now is the time to share it. You can reach me by emailing cold at ksl.com or contact the Roy City Police Department at 801-774-1063. I also want you to know, if you've experienced abuse or sexual violence, you're not alone. There are trained experts ready to listen and help. In the United States, survivors of rape and sexual assault can connect to free resources through the Rape Abuse and Incest National Network at rainn.org. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse in any form, you can reach the National Domestic Violence Hotline at thehotline.org. Cold is a production of KSL Podcasts and Wondery in association with Workhouse Media. Cold is researched, written, and hosted by me, Dave Cauley. Audio production and sound design by Ben Kiebrick and Aaron Mason. Mixing and mastering by Ben Kiebrick. Michael Bonmiller composed our main theme, with additional music this season by Allison Layton Brown. Additional voices in this episode provided by Sean DeTori. My personal thanks to our editorial team Amy Donaldson, Andrea Smarden, Ryan Meeks, Becky Bruce, Kira Faramond, Kellyanne Halverson, Josh Tilton, and Felix Bennell. For Amazon Music and Wondery, managing producer Candace Manriquez Wren. Producer Claire Chambers, Senior Producer Lizzie Bassett, and Executive Producer Morgan Jones. Special thanks to Cale Bittner and Allison Vermeulen. With Workhouse Media Executive Producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella. And for KSL Podcasts, Executive Producer Cheryl Worsley. For pictures and more, go to our website, thecoldpodcast.com, and follow us on social at The Cold Podcast. Most of all, thank you for listening. Hey, Prime members, you can binge every episode of Cold ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.